faith in His Word, believing literally what He had said, believing the exampleship of demonstration that is so profoundly written throughout the Gospels and even throughout the Epistles, recorded for us. Recorded for what? Recorded for you and me to believe and to go out and to begin to apply, to begin to exact, to begin to demonstrate. These examples were left for our admonition and instruction It is the will of God for us to take this authority in our hands and to take it out and to demonstrate it to this present world that is so desperately in need. I want to say that in the last couple of years, I've seen now more than 10 people just simply get out of wheelchairs. Most of them I have never gone near. They have simply been touched by the gift of faith of and they have simply stood to their feet or leaped to their feet and begin to walk. There was one woman in particular. I had my back turned to the audience. I was praying with someone in the altar to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Suddenly, above all the worship, I could hear someone screaming, I am healed, I am healed, I am healed. I turned around and there was a woman who had stood out of her wheelchair and she came walking down the aisle toward the front with her hands in the air, tears streaming literally down her face, uh, screaming, I am healed. God has healed me. I am healed. She walked out of that conference pushing her own wheelchair, healed by the mighty hand of God through the gift of faith. I did not uncork a bottle of oil. I did not lay my hands upon her. God doesn't really need me to do that. He is all sufficient. And when a soul's faith reaches out and touches God in this dimension of the gift of faith, miracles can happen. People suddenly can be healed as easily as they feel Him. About three years ago now, in the Louisiana camp meeting, there was a woman in a wheelchair. And there was a a sister out of the congregation that went to pray for this woman in the wheelchair. And I was observing this from the platform as I was observing many things. I had prayed for many people. There were 10,000 people or more in that service that night. It would be impossible to call everybody out that had a need. Impossible to lay hands upon everyone. Impossible to have a healing line. There would be no way to help that many people. And you might say that at least a third of them would come for some kind of healing or some kind of laying out of hands or some kind of blessing from the hands of the ministry be impossible. You'd be there all night, all day, trying to minister and become exhausted and probably be totally depleted of strength and unable to carry on toward the end of such a prayer line. But the gift of faith, God without us, God doing His thing among the people, is totally unlimited. It has no limitation at all. And so I released, in my way of doing things, and the knowledge I have of these things, I released the gift of faith among the people. And I was praying and worshiping God and simply concentrating upon Him and the moving of His Spirit in that service. Suddenly, I opened my eyes and was watching in this woman's direction. Suddenly, the woman in the wheelchair leaped out of the wheelchair, grabbed the sister that had been praying for her, threw her in the wheelchair and began to push her down the aisle. It was one of the most glorious things that I have ever witnessed in the years of my own personal ministry. I pray to God that you will see like miracles and that I will see more and more and more that we will put to naught the scoffer and the gainsayer, the humanist and the secularist and all the antichrist of this particular hour because the demonstration of God has no equal. Exactly what do you do with an empty wheelchair? What do you do with a pile of crutches? What do you do with a handful of hearing aids? You don't do anything with them. There is no way to fight results. You may not like me. You may not like my message. You may not like my theology. They didn't like Jesus. They didn't like his theology. But they could not fight the results. What do you do with an empty tomb. What do you do with a with a funeral procession that turns into a praise service and comes leaping and running and shouting with victory and joy back to the city gates because the son of a widow 
has been raised from the dead by the sound of a man called Jesus. How do you fight a man who stands in front of a tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth, and he that was dead suddenly comes stumbling out of the entrance of the tomb? You don't fight it. There is no way that you can fight it. This is why I am saying that as ministers, as laity, as workers, as saints of God, as believers, we need to have these signs following because there is no way to fight it. There is no way to fight it. They could reason away Jesus' philosophy. They could reason away his theology. They could argue people out of it. But what do you do with the ex-leper who is now healed, whose flesh is white as white as newborn baby skin? What do you do? What do you do with an ex-cripple who has never walked? What do you do with the man who says, whether he be of God or no, I know not. One thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. There is nothing that you can do against it. And the church needs to take its rightful position and come to its feet and do these glorious exploits for the cause of Jesus and his kingdom. I would like to say at this point that at first when I began to be used in the realm of the gift of faith and when all these healings began to take place and all these miracles began to happen just while I was preaching it has come to the point where I can preach about almost anything I want to and still there will be miracles and healings in the audience among the people. For example, I was in a service in Brother Kilgore's church in January of this year one night, faith was so strong in that service. A woman who was a non-believer, a non-Pentecostal, she had brought her baby. The soft spot in the baby's head was not healing, and there was a lump that had raised an inch high on the top of this baby's head. And faith was so high that this non-Pentecostal suddenly grasped it. She suddenly believed it. Jesus meant people like that. When the Jews should have believed it, they didn't. But it was the Gentiles who suddenly grasped it. It was a Roman soldier who suddenly grasped it. And Jesus rebuked and admonished the so-called believers of that day because those who knew nothing about the truth were suddenly getting it. We saw this happen. This non-Pentecostal jumped to her feet, raised her baby in her hands above her head, and cried, Jesus! And when she did, God instantaneously healed that baby. Instantaneously healed that baby's head. I ran down the aisle when they told me this had happened and got to this young mother and she was just trembling and weeping and crying. And as I remember, she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I took that baby in my own arms and I, I stroked that baby's head and ran my fingers over that baby's head. It was totally healed totally healed by the power of God. The tomb is empty, folks, and Jesus is alive, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. What he did then, he can do now, and he is doing it now. People have been healed of heart disease. People have been healed of cancer. God has replaced kneecaps. He has replaced bones in people's bodies. Not only can he restore, but he also can recreate. And there are innumerable examples I could give tonight in this session for you to view, for you to hear. Not something that happened 2,000 years ago, but something that happened this year, this week, last night. Things are happening among us in this hour that are causing the Holy Scriptures to come alive in our presence, in our midst. God bless this wonderful day of the outpouring of the Spirit in this latter time. Thank God for the building of the latter house and for the outpouring of the latter rain. According to Jewish traditions and because of the uh, land of the Bible and its customs and what the Bible has given us through these particular parallels and these particular parables, we understand that the latter rain will be seven times greater than the former rain or the early rain. That means instead of 3,000 people receiving the Holy Ghost in one day, as it did in the early reign of Pentecost, we can expect something seven times greater than that to take place in our present generation and hour. If this indeed be the time of the latter rain, and we understand the Norfolk Bible prophecy that it is, 
we could expect 21,000 in one day to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thousands are beginning to receive the Holy Ghost in our services, especially on foreign soil. Thousands, hundreds in one service. In two or three days, three or four, five thousand people are beginning to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We ought to come to our feet in every service with great shouting, with great worship, with great praise, and thank God for the ushering in of this hour of might and this hour of miracles. But as I was saying, when I first entered into this realm, it was confusing. I became frustrated because so many things happened almost totally inconspicuously. Some of the greatest miracles that happened in services where I was preaching, some of the most mo notable miracles, I did not find out until the next day or the next week. People would leave the services and discover that the tumor was gone. They would go back to a doctor a month later and uh, the, the, the cancer had vanished. The, the surgery was canceled. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters have come in declaring that surgeries have been canceled, doctors have been canceled, all kinds of things have been canceled because of that individual or those individuals exposing themselves to the presence and the power and the might and the miraculous ability of the Holy Ghost to heal, to perform miracles, and to deliver. This we must have. We will perish as a people without it. We will perish as a nation, so to speak. We will perish as a church. We will perish without the demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. In one service where I was, there was over 7,000 people in this women's conference. There was a woman in the balcony. She had had surgery on her knee some three or four times. The kneecap had been removed, and the doctors now had prognosed that the leg would have to be removed from the knee down, standing in that balcony straight back from the platform where I was preaching. Among all these hundreds and thousands of people, she raised her hands and the gift of faith moved into that congregation. Not only was she healed, but many were healed. But this woman suddenly began to kick her leg. She began to kick her knee. Her knee began to bend. And the kneecap was replaced by the power of God in that service. You know, when I found out about it, I found out about it six months later in another state, in another conference, as I approached the auditorium where I was preaching and this conference was being held, I saw this uh, lovely lady on the arm of her husband walking across the lawn, coming down the sidewalk, and she cried out my name. She said, Brother Stone King, Brother Stone King. And I went over to her, and she began to tell me the story. She had high heels on. She bent her legs. She kicked her foot. And the joy of God was on her face. Because I'm telling you, no matter what the doctors say, no matter what the prognosis is, no matter what the diagnosis is, when all hope is gone and the hand of man has reached its limitation and there is no more hope, there is a voice that says, Try me. Every miracle begins with an impossibility. Every miracle begins with an impossibility. And what the doctors could not do, there still is a Nazarene, there still is a man from Galilee whose name is Jesus that can walk on the scene. You understand me tonight when I say there are many people alive among us that were prognosed and diagnosed to be dead 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but because of, of this man who said, I am the resurrection and the life, because of a man called Jesus who walked on the scene through the hands of, of a humble man, a small congregation, Jesus walked in and he reached forth his hand, he touched and he healed and he reversed the prognosis and the diagnosis of, and our ranks have many people in it uh, that should have been dead a long time ago but Jesus is still the answer he is still the resurrection and the life and he has the last word what he says will come to pass I'm also aware of the fact God has spoken this to me on more than one occasion in fact by this time several occasions uh, I have known that many people who have come into services where the gift of faith was in operation, that many people were healed of diseases that had begun to work in their body 
that would never have come to the surface for another six months or even a year but by coming into the presence of God, by exposing themselves to the awesomeness of the Spirit of the Almighty, they were healed as a reward for their entering into His courts, as a reward for lifting their hands, as a reward for singing the songs of Zion. Oh, what a privilege it is to know these things, to understand these things, to be able to reach out and touch these things. And Brother Libby's uh, near... Washington, D.C., a year ago, two men with a very, with both of them had severe heart conditions. One man sat in bed, propped up each night, could not lie down, constant pain in his chest. I never went near them, didn't know they were even the congregation, didn't know their history, but the gift of faith came upon those men, and God healed both of them instantaneously. They began to dance and shout. One man shouted and danced in the spirit for over 30 minutes. Normally, he would have been dead. He was forbidden to do such a thing. All pain left his chest. He came to me, grabbed my hands with great emotion in his face, and said, Brother Stoking, I can hardly wait to get home. I can hardly wait to lie down. I haven't been able to lie down and go to sleep for months, but tonight I can. Why can he? Because of a man called Jesus. God is able to do anything and everything. There is a tremendous awakening among us in this hour. I thank God for it. The Bible says, Faith cometh. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh. Faith cometh to us. It's like a plane that comes in for landing. It cometh upon us. It cometh to us. But unless we reach out with the hands of our soul, with the hands of our flesh, with the hands of our spirit, with the hands of our innermost being, providing a platform or a landing field for faith as it cometh, it has no place to land. But if we will build, as it were, a landing strip for it, the Holy Ghost will come in and it will settle upon us. Faith will begin to operate among us in an unprecedented manner. In one revival service where I was an aged lady who could not walk without the help of a cane, suddenly in the middle of my preaching, stood to her feet, healed by the gift of faith, and came walking down the aisle to tell the story. This is the kind of power that I'm talking about. This is the kind of power that is available among us. Hundreds are being healed by the gift of faith. Thousands more will be healed in this great surge of revival that is coming upon us in these final hours of the church's existence in this present world. Let's just work back and forth for just a moment with this concept and aspect. There was a woman in Brother Kilgore's church that had been diagnosed as having breast cancer. This woman came forward at the beginning of a service one night and we were asked to anoint her and pray for her and to lay hands upon her, which we did. But I knew as she walked away that she had not received healing. We had gone through the motions. Not that that is bad, but I knew that she was not really healed miraculously. Later in that same service, the Spirit of God began to move as the people were singing. And I felt impressed to leave the platform. And I raced down the aisle, climbed over the end of a pew, and got a hold of the sister and began to pray. And the woman behind her, Sister Nellie is her name, she said, Brother Stone King, she has lost hope. She has lost heart. And I began to minister to her in the Spirit and pray fervently in the Spirit. And I could feel virtue go out of me, go out of me to her. I'm working now with the gifts of healing, that which comes through us, that which is channeled through another human being. Not the gift of faith, but the gifts of healing. As I prayed for her, I felt this virtue go out of me, and she fell backwards speaking with tongues. And the discouragement, the oppression that had clouded her countenance vanished instantaneously, and she began to worship fervently in the presence of the Lord. I knew that she was healed. I knew that God had done it just then. I went back to the platform. I sat down. Brother Kilgore turned to me. 
He said, Brother Stone came. She got it. I said, she really did. That was Sunday night. The next day, she went to the hospital. And when she went to the hospital for surgery, when they opened her up, they could not find one trace of cancer. There was not one trace of anything there. The doctor said to her, when she came out from the anesthetic, he said, you are a very lucky woman. And then he paused. He said, no, this is not luck. I was not wrong. I have diagnosed hundreds of these kinds of cancers. So he said, this is a miracle, and it is a miracle. Now compare that with this. In that same revival, there was another woman who came in on a Sunday morning. She had a brain tumor in the back of her brain the size of a golf ball, and she was facing surgery. She came into the Sunday morning service. People didn't even know she had this condition. She was a stranger to many. She was visiting that Sunday morning. But in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, that is the revelation. That is the understanding. It's not a building. It's not just a service. It's not just religion. You are in the presence of the Lord when we come together in the wonderful name of Jesus. So in the presence of the Lord with the people of God singing and worshiping and the preaching of the word of the Lord going forth. That brain tumor, by the gift of faith, disappeared instantaneously from her brain, from her head. When she went to the doctor the next day, when they checked it and did their CAT scan, they could not find it. The hospital spent the entire day trying to locate that tumor and could not find it. Can you see the contrast between the laying on of hands, the ministering directly from human to human, or the gifts of healing versus the Holy Ghost just walking up to individuals in the congregation and touching them and having them become totally, miraculously, and wonderfully healed by His glorious and wonderful touch. God, God is performing the miraculous in our day. Angels, and this is very important, angels always accompany the gift of faith. Angels are always present to minister when the gift of faith is in operation. And later in this course, I will talk to you more about ministering spirits. But for a conclusive statement to this particular gift of faith, I would like to say that if you ever observe a person suddenly leap out of a wheelchair with no one with hands laid on, no one anointing with oil, you can mark it down that angels have stepped up beside that, that individual, that victim, and they've helped to lift that person out of that wheelchair. Angels are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation, and they always accompany this tremendous and wonderful facet or avenue of the operation of the Spirit of God. Let us now go to the gifts of healing. For this particular gift, the key to proper understanding is the word gifts. There is an S on the word gift. It does not say gift, but it says gifts of healing. Please note the plurality of the word. The Bible does not say gift. It says gifts of healing. Mark 16, 18 makes known to us the promise if the believer lays hands on the sick, they shall recover. This we know to be true. James 5 and 14 talks about the sick calling for the elders of the church, anointing them with oil. In the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Let me just say this for a moment. Do you remember the ten lepers that were healed? Ten were healed, but only one returned. One out of ten is not a good percentage, totally. But neither is it bad, the one percent that came back, <clears throat> or the ten percent that came back. Government statistics in the United States indicate that two parking spaces for the handicap must be available for every 50 parking stalls. If these figures are correct, 4% of the population of a town of 170,000 population are physically handicapped. 
That means 6,800 people could conceivably come through our church doors and be healed. But only 680 would serve God. As for me, I will take the 680 any day. But we must be in a place to receive those who come through our doors. I want to talk to you now about healing itself. The gospel, the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth. Romans 1.16 The gospel is the power of God when believed. Only when it is believed. The gospel is the power of God when it is believed. God's promises are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Proverbs 4 and 22. Until you are fully convinced that God wants you to be well, there will always be a doubt in your mind as to whether or not you will be healed. Once people are convinced that God really wants to heal them, it is easy then to believe. Have you faith that God will keep His promise to you? He will keep His promise to you. That word hasten in Jeremiah 1 and 12, that word hasten means to watch over, to look after, to protect, or stand behind. The Bible says He will hasten to perform it. Don't doubt God. Don't doubt God. If you must doubt something, doubt your doubts. But don't doubt God. Because your doubts are unreliable. But never doubt, doubt God nor His Word. D. L. Moody, a great reformer of modern times in our own country. D. L. Moody said, Is there any reason why you should not have faith in God? Has God ever broken one of His promises? I defy any infidel or unbeliever to place his finger on a single promise God ever made and failed to fulfill. Powerful, a powerful challenge to this present unbelieving world. In Exodus 15 and 26, God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Spoken to of at least three million people. Every one of them believed God's words were true. The result was that every one of them who needed healing was made every whit whole. In Psalm 105 and 37, we are told that God brought them forth and there was not one feeble person among them. Not one feeble person among their tribes. Can you imagine? If it was true for Israel under the law, how much more is it true for us who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10 and 34. In spite of the fact that medical science is demonstrating its greatest achievements in all of history, disease advances in unprecedented measures all over this present world. God said, I am, not I was, but I am the Lord that healeth thee. If under the Old Testament law covenant, at least three million people could be well at one time, then much more should all be well under the new covenant of mercy, grace, and truth, which has been established on better promises, with a better priesthood, through a more excellent ministry. Let's talk about healing for a moment, the whole counsel of God in the Gospels, Jesus literally acted out the will of God for Adam's race. Jesus demonstrated what he wanted his church to do. He demonstrated what he wanted his followers to do. He demonstrated and promised that they would have it. And he gave it into their hands. The healing ministry of Jesus was done as a revelation of God's will for man, for mankind. The message everywhere taught in the Gospels is one of complete healing for soul and body, for all who will come to Him. The leper that came to Jesus said, If it be thy will, 
the first thing Jesus did was to correct his uncertainty by assuring the leper when he said, I will. I will. That I will must be settled forever. Let that I will settle it in your life, in my life, forever. That God will heal the sick. If he wills to heal one, then he wills to heal all. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The epistle of James says, Is there any sick among you? Any, any, any sick. Anybody who is sick, let them call for the elders of the church. The fiery serpent in the Old Testament, as many as looked, lived. Now, as many as looked to Jesus can be saved and healed. If only we preach this more positively, if only we preach this more consistently. For sinners, the words whomsoever and whosoever will are always used, sounding forth the invitation to come and be saved. For the sick, the terminology is used in the Bible as many, everyone, all. These words are used relating and pertaining to those that are sick sounding forth the invitation to the sick and diseased. Both invitations are always universal and the results are always positively promised. Shall be saved, shall have life, recover, shall raise him up, heal them all, as many as touched him were healed. These are biblical expressions, many of them spoken from the lips of the master himself. Sometimes parents show favor among children. God doesn't. God doesn't show favor. God will give of his goodness, his mercy, his healing, his deliverance, his benevolence to anyone that will call upon him. The mistake that people make is that they think that God will treat them the way they treat God. But God is not like us. God is good. He is perfect. He is flawless, and He is the most benevolent force, the most merciful force or knowledge that will ever come into a human mind of understanding. He is the most precious, the most precious experience. The knowledge of the Lord is incomprehensible. The knowledge, the revelation, the understanding of God and His purpose in the earth cannot really be explained with human words, adjectives, adverbs, etc. You have to know Him. You have to experience Him for yourself to fully, totally understand. What a marvelous thing when a person comes into the presence of the Lord and through eyes that are filled with tears suddenly stand and say, I see, I see. What a marvelous thing. What a miraculous expression. What a glorious testimony. How great the attestation to the presence and power of a living Savior. His name is Jesus. When we, when we meet the right conditions, we reap. We reap alike. If God healed all then, He heals all now. Philip, in Acts 8, 6 through 8, Jesus proved Himself the same. To Peter, in Acts chapter 3, the cripple, Jesus proved that He was the same. Paul, in Acts 14, 8 through 10, the impotent man, the man who was impotent in his feet, Jesus proved himself again. Wherever, like, if God healed all then, he heals all now. Philip, in Acts 8, 6 through 8, Jesus proved himself the same. To Peter, in Acts chapter 3, 
the cripple. Jesus proved that he was the same. Paul in Acts 14, 8 through 10, the impotent man, the man who was impotent in his feet, Jesus proved himself again. Wherever and whenever, wherever and whenever Jesus Christ is preached in his full sacrifice for sin and sickness, healing will result, sick bodies, as well as salvation for the lost, always, always follows. Healing is a part of the gospel. We need to simply relax and let it happen. It is the will of God for people to be divinely healed in the Christian church in this hour. It's not relegated for those 2,000 years ago. It is for us today, for whosoever will, for as many as will come. It is still for us today. Thus it is written and thus it is. I cannot alter the word of God and neither can you. Despite all those who will fight it or would fight it, there will be someone somewhere that will touch it. There will be someone somewhere that will come walking out of the obscurity of life and say, it's too late to preach that type of negativism. I have been healed by the touch of the Lord. I have been healed by the hand of the Lord. Let us say that in my yard there is a green tree fully leafed out, fully alive. With my axe or my saw, I cut the tree down. It lies in my yard. A neighbor comes by a day later and says, Oh, I see the tree is still alive. I say, No, the tree has been cut off. It is dead. The neighbor says, But the leaves are green. It's still alive. I say, Come back in a week. You'll see that the tree is dead. And many times, when the elders of the church anoint us with oil and pray for us, many times when hands are laid upon us, because the symptoms remain, we continue to claim the sickness or the disease or the infirmity. If only we could understand that when a man of God lays his hands upon us and he prays in the name of Jesus and commands us to be healed, that the sickness, the disease, the infirmity is cut off at the roots, as it were, in the name of Jesus. And despite the symptoms, despite the pain or the uncomfortableness of the situation, the thing is dead. It is no longer alive. Because the tree stays green, we agree wholeheartedly with the devil that the disease is still there. We need to boldly declare I have been obedient to the word of God. A man of God has prayed for me. The thing is dead in spite of the symptoms, in spite of the green leaves. Special attention should be given to another aspect of the gifts of healing. Has it ever occurred to you that some people can pray especially for the blind and the blind are healed? Others can pray especially for the deaf and the deaf will be healed. There are some people that are very successful in this hour praying for cancer victims, and they are healed. But how is it that a man who prays for the blind and the blind are healed may pray for a cancer victim and the cancer victim not be healed? The understanding is that just as there are specialists in the natural medical field who specialize in one field or another, so because of the S that is placed upon the word gift, gifts of healing. There are specialists that work through the auspices of the divine will of God to specialize in praying for certain diseases, certain conditions, and God, through the gifts of healing, operates as he chooses, as he wills. If we can understand this, then you will not be shocked if a man of God who is successful in one area prays for someone in another area and that person is really not healed and we do not see it, it should not shatter our faith. It should only help us to understand that God mysteriously, wonderfully, 
works after the counsel of his own will.